listening to Overwatch League Daily, your daily source for Overwatch League news, scores, and more. Here's your host, Kicked Tripod. Good morning, Overwatch League fans. This is your Overwatch League Daily episode for March 10th, 2018. In Overwatch League news, the front office has issued warnings, fines, or suspensions for four different Overwatch League players and coaches. First, Taimu of the Dallas Fuel was fined $1,000 for using anti-gay slurs on his personal stream. The Houston Outlaws coach Ty Rong received a formal warning for posting an offensive meme on social media. Silk Thread of the LA Valiant was fined $1,000 for violating the Blizzard end user license agreement for account sharing and XQC has been suspended four matches as of March 12th and is fined $4,000 for using a Twitch emote in a racially disparaging manner on the Overwatch League stream and on social media. Player conduct and how the league treats infractions has been a really hot topic lately. If you haven't, I really recommend that you watch or listen to both Overwatch League daily episodes with myself and Trevor May from earlier this week where we touch on some of the sensitive topics around professionalism in Overwatch League and the esports as a whole. That's it for the news today. I sat down with Evie Ham Tornado Feng to discuss yesterday's matches. And speaking of yesterday's matches, here's the scoreboard brought to you by patreon.com slash OWL Daily Show. For the first match of the evening, the London Spitfire, who have not lost a match since February 23rd, take on the struggling Boston Uprising, who have yet to take a win in Stage 2 and have yet to take a map since February 22nd. This one went as expected as the London Spitfire would sweep the Uprising four maps to zero. For the second match of the evening, the NYXL would look to get revenge against the Philadelphia Fusion, who accounted for their only loss in the regular season of Stage 1. This one was a little bit more one-sided as the NYXL would defeat the Fusion three maps to one. The New York Excelsior are currently in first place with 13 wins, two losses, and a plus 32 map differential. For the final match of the evening, the 1-13 Florida Mayhem look to take on a slumping Outlaws who have lost their last three matches. The Mayhem start out strong as they would go up two maps to zero at halftime. However, Houston would answer back and take the match into a tiebreaker. On Ilios, it was all Houston as they would take the series three maps to two. Let's get to my discussion with Evie about yesterday's matches. So let's let's start. Let's actually just skip Uprising and Spitfire. Let's just <laughs> pretend that one didn't happen. Well, it did happen, but we were kind of discussing uh, before we started recording that it just, in the end, it just kind of is more of the same for both of mm. these squads. London, for the most part, are really looking great right now. The uprising just uh just can't turn it on yeah unfortunately i yeah i know you talked about kind of the struggles previously in your other shows about boston you know gelling their roster and really finding that special the special something that they had during stage one surprising us all uh and in this matchup unfortunately for today london spitfire they just showed themselves to be the superior team one for one you know roll to roll they they there's just not really anything boston could do to best them yeah, so let, 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 let's discuss the NYXL versus Fusion match because mm-hmm. this one was pretty pretty exciting. The the Fusion, the, the Achilles heel of the Fusion that we've seen since kind of day one is consistency. They're the only team to beat NYXL in stage one in regular play. NYXL mm-hmm. went nine and one. And then they, they'll lose to, who did they lose to like right after that? They lost to... A bottom three, bottom four team. It might have been like the fuel or something like that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But why? Why do you think that the that that uh, the, the fusion struggle so much with with consistency? Well, uh, I mean, in, I think it, it comes down boils down to a couple of factors. They have they have a pretty standard roster that they really like to run. I mean, the, their two 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 dive definitely really good. But who's playing those key DPS heroes? Carpe, he's very steady and consistent, but Shadowburn uh, and EQO now, who have, who has come to join this Fusion roster, they have such incredibly different 
play styles. Shadowburn, you know, vaunted Genji name of of old, uh, very well known to, as being an extremely conservative Genji, if there is really such a thing. But you know, oftentimes he'll be holding that blade. You know, you see from multiple fights, waiting for the exact perfect moment that he feels he can make maximum impact. And you know, for for better or worse, oftentimes you know he draws the blade and is usually you know forced to reflect almost immediately because everybody's like Shadowburn, that Genji is ulting, and are all you know piling onto him trying to tear his face off. And contrast that with EQO, who is going to be a very fresh face, not just coming Ooh. in for us into the Overwatch League, but just in the pro Overwatch scene in general. Not too much is known about this guy other than I think he believe, I, he played in the World Cup. Um, so there's not too much footage on his play style. And he is the exact polar opposite. Such an incre ag aggressive Genji coming in. You see, uh, I mean, shades of almost other Genjis that we know, like Agility, you know, pulling out YOLO blades and when his team might be down, a member being like, oh, I can, you know, make up that man difference. And oftentimes it works out quite well. I think EQO, one of his uh, biggest assets is the fact that his he doesn't have... Um, a long history so people don't really know what to expect and his overt aggression often catches his enemies off guard granted you know there's also pros and cons to that there's also cons to that playstyle as well many a time has he you know drawn the blade ready to be a hero but he turns into a zero because he gets you know shut down immediately and sent back to respawn um so that's kind of the DPS side of fusion. And then in today's series specifically, we it's also really worth mentioning that Boombox is sick, so they were subbing in Dayfly, uh, who may be familiar to those of you who have been watching, following Overwatch for quite some time. Dayfly was a support player from uh, Africa Freaks Blue, actually, back in those Apex days, where he kind of unfortunately earned a reputation as a somewhat inconsistent support player. In particular, his positioning was often very suspect. He put himself at risk and, uh, you know, forced his teammates to, you know, get in uncomfortable positions trying to protect him and was a little bit of a liability. So having having to sub in Dayfly for Boombox, who's a well-known, you know, fragger as a Zenyatta and a great support player, also probably, you know, shifted the foundations of that Fusion team just a little bit. It's also worth mentioning that Fusion is... Uh, has significantly less hours playing together out of all of the teams in Overwatch League right now due to some visa issues. So uh, at, in terms of consistency, one, it's the different types of players getting subbed in. Sometimes the unfortunate circumstances means that they haven't really had as much practice time together. But these are all just, you know, growing pains and stuff. I mean, we saw Boston really gel together. And uh, I, I believe that Fusion can find that same consistency, just, you know, given a little bit more time and experience. Do you think that there might be an aspect of the fact, because, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, uh, this this is a team that pretty much relies on on dive, right? You, mm -hmm. you have the sacrificial mm -hmm. fraggy into uh, what, whatever it else it might be. Do you think that maybe just teams who can prepare for that maybe just do better and maybe looks like inconsistency on the fusion side when in actuality it might just be preparation on their opponent's side? Oh, certainly. I mean, fusion, unfortunately, they rely so heavily on the Genji that, uh, you know, a lot of teams, not only, you know, because they know these well-known players who have a long history and they can view that footage, but also just the style that the team plays really, really favors that dive. I mean, occasionally we see get, you know, Shadowburn pull, take off, you know, the Genji, the Genji onesie and uh, put on the Fara, or maybe sometimes even occasionally the Junkrat, but it's clear that his preferred hero is Genji and that Fusion prefers to run that dive around him. And so it is certainly a little bit limiting when you have to play Genji on maps that maybe a Genji is a little slightly less favored because I feel like in today's meta, a Genji getting huge value out of his ultimate or even his, you know staying alive and surviving through those team fights is often a very dicey situation. It, you know, it's a hard knock life for Genjis these days between the McCrees, the Widowmakers, and the Junkrats. So yeah, I think you know there's definitely a lot of credit to be given to the teams who are able to come up against Fusion and t you know topple them due to that uh, superior preparation and counter picking. Let's let's look on the other side of the coin then and talk about NYXL. If there's a team mm -hmm. that I think has, besides being consistently in the L column like Shanghai, uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> at, the other team that really kind of screams consistency is uh, NYXL. They've only lost two matches so far. One of those mm -hmm. matches was when they were out with Ark. Ark was out. Uh, what... 
I, rather rather than go in there, let's let's just start here. Do our NYXL outside of record, like obviously record wise, they're the best team in Overwatch League right now. But mm-hmm. uh, outside of record, is this the best team in Overwatch League? Is this the best team in the world right now? Ooh, that's that's gonna be a tough one because they they actually aren't sitting on top of stage two right now, at least in terms of series wins or map wins. That I think it, I believe it's Dynasty, then NYXL, and then London Spitfire sitting in third place. But they certainly did come out in to- on top in terms of series wins in stage one, not counting playoffs. We're we're gonna forget that Spitfire beat them, but uh, but yeah, no, they're certainly an extremely high performing team at you know and. And the fact that every single one of their DPS shows up every day with their, you know, carry pants on, ready to put in the work is, is certainly something to behold. Although I, I will point out a couple of times where uh, Libero has seemed like he may not be, um, he, he may not be performing at quite the same level as some of his other teammates. We have seen uh, the, the the Genji, right? You you draw the blade and then you miss the first dash and then you're basically just walking around the rest can, of the map. Yeah, you can fall yeah. flat sometimes, yeah. it feels like. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I mean, NYXL certainly is one of the top teams. I mean, this Sebeoli's Tracer is one of the most unassailable tracers in the league and just in, gen- in Overwatch in general. Pine, of course, unparalleled on that Widowmaker, Libero, a very capable uh, projectile player. Ark, Jonak, of course, uh, famous for getting all those frags. I mean, his damage is equal to his healing in many of these series. And every single one of the players in NYXL is just basically, is, I don't know, at the top of their game. So it's going to be very difficult for any of the teams to try and best them. So uh, I, I want to talk about uh, the Florida Mayhem versus the Houston Outlaws, actually. I want to skip ahead a little bit because this was a mm-hmm. really interesting uh, a really interesting match. Uh, we saw the Mayhem come out strong out of the gate uh, with 2-0 lead. Uh, I was getting ready to order my Mayhem jersey. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> what did they do specifically to beat Houston on those first two maps? Well, I... I, I, me, me too, though, KT. I, I was feeling it. I was so ready to, you know, like run out with my Naruto run and be like, yeah, mayhem. Yeah, <laughs> but, right. uh, yeah, I feel, it feels bad. But, <laughs> um, yeah, so the, those first two maps going into before halftime, it looked like this mayhem team may have finally found their groove, right? Uh, the key, the key difference, both Logix and Tavik were performing extremely well. I, we we've heard these names. I mean, Tavik he's been in the scene forever, but going back into you know contenders season zero, uh, both he and Logics when they're on Misfits, people were like, oh, Misfits are going to dominate the European scene. Tavik he has one of the deepest hero pools. He may be the best player in Overwatch, not even EU Overwatch, just in general. Logics' names was floated as one of the best tracers in the West. Uh, unfortunately, though, once they transitioned from that Misfits team into Mayhem and kind of started going up against the other Owl teams, they started to see that things fall a little bit short to Vic's playstyle, where he often uh, relies on big ultimates to clutch out team fights. It kind of showed its streaky nature. Logics, uh, you know, it could be the land jitters. It could just be his inexperience in general on stage. It was uh, showing a little bit of inconsistency. Very quiet for, for a Tracer, which is not really something you want to see. In, in that hero who has so much carry potential. But in this series, goodness gracious, uh, like both the two of them just popped up. They were going insane. And what incredible synergy from their teammates as well to recognize what these two DPS players were doing and to be able to support them. So I'm just going to dive right in. Hanamura, this was a 4-3 map, so somewhat close between Houston, but Houston has been floated as, of course, one of the best teams in the West. People are expecting incredible things out of them. And for Mayhem to be able to take this first map, 4-3, is setting a really great statement. Uh, to Vic on that Genji, he, has, he gets the blade. He dives straight in off of the choke, you know, no poking necessary. He goes in, immediately deletes both of the supports from Houston Outlaws and just ca- catches the Outlaws utterly off guard. And then once he throws that blade in, immediately swaps to the Soldier 76 for the point B take to grab that high ground. And it's just those kind of small, small points of polish, I think, that really helped the Mayhem uh, give them give them the edge moving into Hanamura. That's the Tavik side, the Logic side also popping off. There was a. I remember there was a point where um, 
both uh, both Bonnie and Rockus were on the high ground overlooking point B. Uh, uh, Logix runs in, pulse bomb, sticks Bonnie, deletes him, blinks back in, one clips Rockus. And it's just those in, you know, in the span of one second, you just destroyed the entire outlaws backline. It's those just incredibly crisp moments that we've we know that these players can bring that uh that won them that fight yeah it, w- it was definitely it was really fun to watch um he, you really want the mayhem to uh regardless of what you really want them to do well you don't want to see them at one in 14 or one in 15 wherever they're at but right now they've got one win it was against the dragons four zero it's obvious the mayhem are near the bottom in Overwatch League. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when it came down to this series specifically, did you see it more as uh, the mayhem performing well or the Houston Outlaws uh, c- kind of underperforming? And we've seen the Outlaws struggle so far in Stage 2. They started out mm-hmm. really strong and then uh, lost three in a row. Yeah, it's uh, unfortunately, I think the outlaws realized perhaps a little belatedly that they could no longer rely on Jake one tricking Junkrat. Um, team one, it's no longer quite as powerful in this meta. Two, that, you know, teams have been playing against his Junkrat, you know, the entirety of stage one, and they're starting to come up with countermeasures. So, it's a, you know, it's time to diversify your portfolio. But unfortunately for the outlaws, that has been a bit of a painful, you know, pr- painful learning process, a lot of. Uh, you know, poor returns on some investments as we've seen Jake kind of go on to the Tracer sometimes, the 76, the Ara even in today's series. And it just hasn't, it just hasn't quite been working out in the same way. Uh, Junkrat just in general as a hero is extremely bursty. You can often, you know, rely on like clutch moments, like a cushion mine to get yourself out of a poor position. Um, whereas, you know, a Soldier 76 or, or a Far are much more reliant on the rest of the team, you know, communicating with the rest of the team, making sure that your positioning is on point, that everybody knows what's going on. And it's much more difficult to clutch out fights that way. So I think that was definitely one of the difficulties for Outlaws. But going back to your question as to were the Mayhem performing extremely well or was Houston underperforming? I, I, I think Houston performed basically very consistently throughout the series. Um, the only difference that really that they made was swapping Linkser onto the Widow after halftime, which basically which made all of the difference really. That somehow, okay, uh, we'll we'll go back to the the mayhem question. Mayhem were absolutely performing out of their minds in the first two series. Outlaws had no idea how to counter what they were bringing to the table. The aggression looked entirely different from the mayhem that you know we've been used to seeing so far in Overwatch League, and they were unprepared. After halftime, apparently mayhem. It, it felt a little bit like they were like, "Oh wow, that was working really well, guys. Let's uh, let's change things." <laughs> and unfortunately, you know, links are going on to the Widowmaker on Hollywood. Links are one of the best widows, you know, in the game. And not only that, but outlaws, you know, giving him the support and resources that they they usually afford him. You know, they were they were continuing to play their game. We saw that the Jake Rat tried to come out on the first point defense. The tires weren't really landing. It was very rough. Uh, Mayhem took that point with you know relative ease, but then moving into streets phase, I don't know what happened. It was logics. Logics on that Widowmaker, not going to be you know dumping on logics at all. But you can't you can't deny the fact that when you are your head looks like a sieve from all the headshots <laughs> that Linkser has landed onto you, it might be time to you know try on a different set of clothes, try on a different look because Tavik, of course, are, is also a very capable tracer, but chase like swapping out to Vic onto the tracer for Logix's Widowmaker, who is getting consistently shut down, is a very poor trade in anybody's book. You don't have to have, you know, gone to the Wharton School of, you know, business to know that it might be time to, you know, Wharton switch School things back around. Uh, Come on. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. so yeah, I just, I just not entirely sure why Mayhem were so stubborn. Houston, they showed up, they played their game, they played consistently, as we know. They weren't really changing anything. I think it was absolutely that Mayhem were not punishing the unforced errors that Outlaws was affording them and refusing to play their players on their best heroes. That That's basically what it came down to. I, I remember very specifically in, uh, in Gibraltar, the, the fourth map before they went into the tiebreak, Jake was on the Genji, tr- trying his best, of course. But it was, again, you know, the first miss- missed dash, he was just had the sword, he was just carrying it, like 
be afraid. And he was running around, you know, the, the floor of the hangar, like a guy at a LARP or something. And Mayhem just <laughs> didn't punish him. They just didn't dive him. And, and he survived. And it was those small, small mistakes that Mayhem could have made. Like, you know, they get a pick, they have a 5v6, but they don't go in. They don't go in aggressive. They're waiting too long. And, um, and that, you know, allows outlaws to, you know, reposition, so on and so forth. So, yeah, it was, it was just a really unfortunate situation that Mayhem weren't able to continue their, continue their, uh, their push uh, moving on after halftime. So I'm going to, I'm going to throw you a curveball here before we, <laughs> before we get All out right. of here for the day. And uh, so I, I didn't uh, prep you for this one, but I'm curious oh because boy. Jake has been a, uh, a, a big discussion point recently mm-hmm. with uh, the, the Junkrat nerfs coming into Overwatch League. Do you think his Tracer and Genji are good enough, are Overwatch League level when compared to the other talent that we're seeing on the other teams? Uh, let's see. Tracer and Genji specifically, no. It's, it's, I, I don't know. It's just really unfortunate. I would say he's kind of a, he, he's a utility Tracer, a utility Genji. As in, he, he knows, Jake again is a player with incredible game sense. But the way that he, he picked up on Junkrat and how to, I wouldn't say necessarily exploit, but certainly take advantage of, you know, his power early on, way before anybody else believed in Junkrat, shows that he's an incredibly intelligent player. However, that unfortunately doesn't really translate into his execution on other heroes. He may understand how to play Tracer, how to play Genji, how, how to play Soldier 76 even, but whether it's the communication between him and his team, whether or not it's you know his excitement or his desire to help getting a, the better of him, he's just not uh, at the level of, say, Sebiobi, Prophet, Bird Ring, Rascal, you know, even even Linkser has a, a much more, uh, a much better performing Genji historically than than Jake, and I think that he certainly still has a, a place on that Outlaws team. But the the out, Houston is showing a little bit of weakness in terms of you know what kind of DPS threats can they bring to the table. They have Linkser, of course, Jack of all trades, and you know, Jerry uh, Finland's gift to esports, Maslin, of course. <laughs> But then when you look at, you know, the Tracer, who's such still even such a powerful hero and can really turn the tides of the fight in your favor if you have, you know, a good one on your side. Clockwork, again, coming in from, you know, kind of his Phenography days, more of a utility Tracer. Uh, and and with Outlaws having to rely a lot on Muma and Cool Mat to put in the damage uh, because they don't really have those extremely on point and bursty players who can wield those flankers. It, it has been a very difficult look for them. Uh, Muma getting focused down really early makes things very difficult to get anything done, especially when you're trying to run that dive. And so uh, it, kind of going back to your question, Jake, Tracer and Genji specifically, I don't think it's it's going to probably take a little bit more time before he's up to the, the top level of the other performers. I think that's well said. Evie, thank you so much for uh, stopping by and hanging out. I, I, I loved sure. having you on the show. We have to do it again. Uh, but for real, thanks so much uh, again for stopping by. Of course, it's always a pleasure, man, and uh, happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks to Evie for stopping by on the show. Make sure to follow her on Twitter at ham underscore underscore tornado. That's ham underscore underscore tornado. Tomorrow, I'm going to be joined by Hurix. Uh, We're going to actually discuss, he was casting um, the entirety of Overwatch Pit, and we're going to discuss some of the up-and-coming talent that we're seeing in the Tier 2 scene. We're going to be doing that in two parts, one part for NA and one part for EU. If you like the show, make sure to subscribe on YouTube, iTunes, or your podcast app of choice to not miss future episodes, and you can watch or listen to the show on the front page of winstonslab.com. Don't forget, you can find links to everything at overwatchleaguedaily.com. And if you have questions or comments for the show, email me overwatchleaguedaily at gmail.com. My thanks again for Evie for joining me. I'll be back with Hurix tomorrow for another episode of Overwatch League Daily.